the growth, runaway growth. The, the nation was industrializing, tremendous wealth creation. But all of this created instability in many social, economic, political, and environmental problems. Do you know that McLean lived through three political assassinations of US presidents? He was seven when Lincoln was killed, 24 when Garfield was killed, and 44 when McKinley was assassinated. So there was a sense of political anarchy in the United States, instability, chaos. And it was leaders like George P. McLean that sought to bring order out of chaos and solve many pressing social, economic, political, and environmental problems. He was of that generation of Theodore Roosevelt. And I think you will learn a good deal about that time period in my book. I believe many of us know a lot about the Civil War, but we fast forward to World War II. And those years in between, we gloss over, and I think there's a lot of misunderstandings about what happened. And it's a critical period in our history. The third life event for McLean was his time of defeat and exile in the political wilderness. So on one level, my book is an inspiring story about how a person emerges from a very dark period in his life to perhaps his most fruitful. It's inspiring to see someone learn from his mistakes and his setbacks and not quit and not live the Jay Gatsby lifestyle that was so available to him after inheriting that large sum of money. So as I bring my remarks to a close, I want to touch on George P. McLean's legacy. The MBTA, as I said, has saved millions, if not billions, of birds and prevented extinctions. Well, that is, in and of itself, a significant legacy. But there's some other dimensions to his achievement that need to be highlighted. The MBTA was foundational law. It was precedent-setting legislation that paved the way for the federal government to take on this watchdog role, set standards for the states, and enforce them that we take for granted today. So acts like the Endangered Species Act, the Animal Welfare Act, even the Environmental Protection Act, those, the MBTA paved the way for that role of the federal government that we now think is we take for granted. Secondly, this achievement was global in nature. Here's the, the secret, the genius of the MBTA. It was a series of treaties between and among nations and the U.S. Constitution has something called the Supremacy Clause, which means that they cannot abrogate or change a treaty between nations. And so the workaround that McLean and others came up with to preserve and protect birds was in formulating this legislation as treaties. It was pure genius. And it also protects birds wherever they are in their migratory cycle. Birds aren't respecters of national borders, but now birds are protected wherever countries sign the MBTA, and many signed the MBTA immediately, and it's grown uh, over time in terms of the countries who participate. And lastly, McLean's legacy is all around us. We're, we're part of that, you know, the, the, the game refuge. He set that aside in his will because he wanted the public to enjoy the things of God that he encountered there and he gave him peace of mind and body and soul and I believe that was part of his recovery process after his bout with depression. This McLean Care home was endowed in, by, by George P. McLean and I think he was visionary in the sense that widows and indigent people needed care in their, uh, in their later years as we now take for granted but this was on the uh, the leading edge of that idea in the 1930s to set up the McLean Care Home. And lastly, McLean was a great reformer in the area of mental health. During that time in the political wilderness, he got involved in many professional associations to upgrade the care for the mentally, uh, mentally ill. And these are lasting reforms now in the form of the uh, Mental Health America Association was the now version of that one that he helped start up. So it was as if he said, I have this problem and I'm going to help others in the process. So I'll have a closing question for you. And it was a question 
once asked about another famous George. I'll see if you know who that George was. But the question is, what would the world be like if George P. McLean had never been born? You know, that other famous George was, was George Bailey from the movie It's a Wonderful Life. What would the world be like if George McLean had never been born? Well, I believe that in time, some form of bird protection legislation would have been signed. But when and to what extent? Through experience, McLean learned how to become an effective leader. In short, he was the right person at the right time, in the right place, to do the right thing. And he learned these skills through experience. He learned first how to uh, communicate urgency and vision. That's what a good leader does in leading change. His first speech in the Senate on migratory bird treaty, on the migratory bird issue. He held hearings where he brought uh, Audubon societies, conservation groups, business leaders like Henry Ford, gun manufacturers to the table to find a way to craft this legislation. He had urgency and vision. Secondly, he had the skill to overcome obstacles that came about through opposition. This legislation morphed and changed a number of significant times in the seven year period because McLean decided he wasn't gonna stick with one solution, but he was gonna incorporate the valid objections of other people and make legislation that would be more effective that way. Third, he knew how to build coalitions, another important skill of a leader. And the most important ally he had in the struggle was then President Woodrow Wilson, who was a Democrat. McLean a Republican, and yet the two came together to get this legislation signed on July 3rd, 1918. That would be like President Joe Biden working with Republican Marco Rubio to get gun control legislation signed today. And that's what those two did together. They were able to overcome their partisan differences to do the right thing. And this was at a time when their opponents were saying, we need to delay this legislation once again because we're at war. World War I was in full bloom in 1918. The US was a full participant. And the opponents of this legislation said that until the war was over, we're not even going to discuss Migratory Bird Treaty Act. There was also a flu epidemic that year and much political and social unrest because this was an unpopular war. But the two came together, and despite the stress and the continued foot dragging of the opponents, they got this legislation signed in 1918. I believe the window of, was closing on reform. This progressive era was coming to a close around 1918. We were entering the Roaring Twenties, a time of peace and prosperity and normalcy, and you could easily see the idea of bird protection taking uh, the, the back burner. People saying, we don't need to do that now, we're, we're, we're prosperous. And that was followed by the 1930s, time of economic calamity. And once again, bird protection legislation could have been forgotten, lost, or watered down. So in closing, I believe that our world is a better place because George P. McLean didn't quit after that very turbulent time as governor, and he didn't leave the scene to enjoy his hundred million dollars, but instead he found a way back into government service and along with many others, he helped stop the killing of some of God's most beautiful creations and put in place lasting legal protections for birds that we still benefit from and enjoy today. So thank you very much. Now I'd love to field some questions from any of you who uh, have uh, some questions about Senator McLean. I, as I said, I've been on a little bit of a book tour, of seven stops, and it's amazing some of the questions that I've gotten are people that knew some fact about uh, the McLeans that they brought to my attention or had uh, some interesting comments. So, yes, sir. 
Yeah. The question was, did he have a relationship with, with uh, Theodore Roosevelt? And I'm a presidential junkie, okay? I resolved at a very early age that I was going to read a biography about every president, and I think I'm just about there. Uh, John Quincy Adams seems to slip through the cracks. I don't know. It's probably interesting, but... Um, so I really focused on his relationship with all the presidents that he knew. But Theodore Roosevelt was indeed a very close professional and personal associate. Uh, there was some, uh, an interview in the McLean archives of McLean's chauffeur where he recounted many experiences picking up Theodore Roosevelt to visit the, uh, the home, the McLean home where they would hunt together. And Roosevelt interviewed McLean for Secretary of the Navy in 1901, which was about the time that he was experiencing this crisis in his mental health. And for whatever reason, he did not become Secretary of the Navy. Um, whether he declined it or he was given the position, but they were close. Um, Roosevelt endorsed McLean for the Senate on uh, the first two elections. But then they had a little bit of a falling out because Theodore Roosevelt went his own way. He started his own party called the Bull Moose or the Progressive Party, I think, uh, in 1912. And McLean was a very loyal Republican. And I think at that point, um, they, they drifted apart to, to a large degree. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. So two questions about that. One is, did, did that change come about in part because of his advocacy or with, at least within his lifetime so he could see it happen? And secondly, we have the same problem with the U.S. Senate. I think mm -hmm. there's a third of it. And do we ever bring mm -hmm. up the same notion of reform there? Well, the, the question is about this town system in Connecticut. Um, it did, when did it change? How did it change? And that is a, a fascinating question because that legislature kept the town system until 1965. And the only reason that it was changed was in response to a US Supreme Court mandate now known as the one person, one vote that have impacted every state, not just Connecticut. Because state legislatures were very corrupt and biased towards whatever group was in power that wanted to uh, favor itself. So for example, in the South, legislatures were set up to disenfranchise African Americans. In Connecticut, it was biased towards the small towns. So it really wasn't until 1965, that's how deeply entrenched that system was. And it really, to me, is the battle between the towns and the cities, because people in that era especially thought sins were dens of iniquity. Uh, that cities, big cities, excuse me, were dens of iniquity, and they wanted to limit their uh, control of the legislature. Plus, U.S. senators were elected by state legislators until 1913. So there was a lot at stake in this town system. The towns could control who went to the Senate, and there was rampant corruption. A Part-time legislator in Connecticut in 1900 was paid about $500, which is the equivalent of maybe 5,000 today. And it was not uncommon around the country that big city people would come to a rural legislator and say, here's $500 on top of the 500 you're already making and I want you to vote for Joe Smith for Senate. And there was rampant corruption in the US Senate until the, here it is, does anyone know the 17th Amendment? You know, here's your Jeopardy question. 18th was prohibition, 19th was um, women's suffrage, 17th, uh, no, no takers, oh, yes, sir. Yeah, popular election. There we go, 
There's your final Jeopardy champion, the popular election of US senators. George McLean was the only Northeast senator to vote yes on that 17th Amendment. The entrenched interests to keep that system in the hands of the legislature were very strong. And this is part of his story, that it wasn't, he was a reformer at heart in many ways. Now, in many ways, he was not. But I think in terms of political reform, he, he really strongly believed in that. And that is an example of uh, how, uh, what a reformer he was. You know, other senators like Henry Cabot Lodge and others were all against that amendment. But McLean was unique um, in voting yes on that uh, 17th Amendment, allowing for the people to elect our senators, something we take for granted today, but there was a time when that didn't happen. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. The question was, which were the starting countries in the signing of the Migratory Bird Treaty Act? And that's a fascinating question because Great Britain was the original signatory representing Canada because we wanted to, we wanted Mexico involved, but we were at war with Mexico. Do you remember, have you heard about Pancho Villa and these incursions into Mexico? We were at very bad uh, diplomatic relationships with Mexico, but not Canada. So this was negotiated in, say, 1916, 17, 18, in Europe with the king of, of England, of Great Britain. And that's remarkable, isn't it? Because they were at war in Europe, and it was a, a very bloody war in, in Europe in particular for Great Britain and France. And yet, Wilson and Maclean, and I document in the book, um, made sure that this, this treaty negotiation went on uh, undisturbed. So that's remarkable to me that um, Great Britain took the time because they could have had a reason to say, hey, we, we're not going to deal with migratory birds. We're trying to survive here against Germany. But in terms of how it unfolded, um, it's a very live document, the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. It continues to be refined. Other nations joined over the decades. And it has been supported virtually throughout its 100 years, um, with a couple exceptions. Any other questions? Yeah. Sure. Hartford Public High School. Yes, it's the same school today. It's the same. It's the major high school in Hartford. And I do discuss a little bit about that in terms of the composition of the class, the men versus women, or a good deal of women at that school. And it was considered to be one of the best high schools in America at that time, behind Boston Latin. It had been a school to train ministers, in the, uh, you know, uh, gospel ministers, and it expanded its curriculum from there yeah. and became an outstanding public high school. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. And you mentioned these grants uh, at $3 million. Yes. How did you choose those? Yes. Grants? Right. Somebody must help me here, but there's a, I'll call it a finishing school. I don't know if that's an appropriate term anymore. It's called the Porter School. It's where Jacqueline Anassis, I know, went there. Yeah. She attended that. Um, so she went to that school. Um, she married twice, um, and these men have been described variously as merchants, wool merchants, importing wool, financiers, and land speculators. So it sounds like people who made a lot of money who leverage it to make a lot more. And she lived in a very fashionable area of New York City, one of those brownstones. But she wasn't all about money either. And I talk about her life in the book. Uh, she was very much involved in benevolence, uh, set up the first hospital in New York City to benefit women uh, for childbirth and uh, care for, after care for women. Uh, very much involved in missions work in New York City. Um, but she was very, very wealthy. And she and George McLean had a very close relationship. And she lived 
here in Simsbury for months of the year. And she entrusted him with those funds with the idea that he was going to use that money to benefit the whole family. And that's one of the things that I find so inspiring about him from perhaps a more personal level was how much money he gave to his widowed sisters to support them, one of whom was my great-grandmother. So there's a personal connection there in the sense that he didn't use that money to, I hope you know what I mean by Jay Gadsby lifestyle, it's that you know, the, the decadent lifestyle of the 1910s and 20s. But he used that money to help his family. Uh, and if you look at his will, it's all about giving to churches and um, hospitals, the game refuge, this place. Uh, I think he just had a set of moral values that uh, made wealth less important to him than the... Uh, proverbial lottery winner who shoots his alarm clock with a gun the day after you know he wins he or she wins all that money yes sir did he ever hunt, did he ever hunt? Um, another great question uh, that was part of his boyhood and early adulthood he was a very very keen hunter and he helped set up regulations at the local level primarily bag limits to limit hunting. But here's what I found significant is he eventually um, renounced hunting. And it was primarily with the advent of the shotgun and he saw the damage that was doing to bird populations. And that I think is interesting because uh, again, it shows his heart was not all about just you know, entertainment and his hobbies, but he saw the bigger picture that he couldn't contribute to the problem anymore, and so he renounced hunting and took up golf and played it just about as badly as I do, I think. From <laughs> Yes, ma'am. Yeah, I think the question was, did Gifford Pinchot and McLean interact and reinforce each other's love of nature and the importance of, of uh, maintaining and preserving it. Um, I know the two knew each other well. They were in the same social circles. Um, you know, the Eno family and the McLean family were quite close. I never found any correspondence between the two, and I looked in the Gifford Pinchot archives, which are quite significant. Um, but I think they did play an important role in shaping the views of one another. And I'm reminded by my third cousin who's in the audience, and we met for the first time today, <laughs> Bill Cox, that George P. McLean knew how to take advice. And he took advice from Pinchot and from his brother, John McLean, who was a man of a, a Renaissance man and had a heart for many different subjects, including ornithology and nature. And so while George P. McLean was a leader, he certainly was a person that had been influenced by many, many people. And the MBTA was a team effort as well. I don't want you to uh, think that he was single-handedly responsible for this. Um, Olmsted, the landscaper. Yes, I looked for so many intersections between McLean and others, but he was a poor correspondent if he wrote much. And I also have a theory that whatever personal papers he had ended up uh, in, in a big bonfire. And uh, the only letters I've been able to find of his were congressional, you know, Senate letterhead, uh, with a few exceptions. I probably found about a dozen handwritten letters in different historical societies throughout the state. Um, but he w either wasn't a much of a correspondent. Hmm. Must have battery, must have died. Um, <laughs> he either wasn't much of a correspondent or a lot of this, uh, what he wrote was discarded. But I tend to think that it was more a fact that 
he didn't write a lot of his own personal views in a diary or letters that were of a personal nature. I think he was much more reserved. And so the archival record on him is, isn't as bountiful as I wish. But if anybody knows of a stash of letters, you know, the red ribbon around it or something, um, I'll gladly take them off your hands. But I did find several dozen letters of his scattered around different archives in the country. And there were many writings in our family about him and the impact that he had on family members and their impressions of him that I weave through the book. So, yes, sir. I'm going to have, um, well, it was, uh, the, well, the McLean home that is now an assisted living center, the governor's mansion, so to speak, that was, he built that house, I think, in 1896. And prior to that, across the road a bit, there was the family homestead that is now the Hopwood Country Club. Hop Meadow. Hop Meadow. Got half of it right. And so that home had been in the family for many generations. I think that was built by his grandfather, Alan McLean, who was minister at the First Church of Simsbury from about 1800 to 1860. He built that house probably around 1810, and that was torn down. And then the governor's house was built, I think, in 1896. It was about a third the size of what you now see. But it was significant, um, significant house. But note, he built that in 1896, well before he inherited that money from his aunt Sarah. So he had a significant wealth. Not that that's important, but I'm just saying that he built that home and he stayed there and loved that home. And he didn't say, well, now that I hit the lottery, so to speak, I'm going to build a house um, twice as big on Newport, Rhode Island. I don't know why I'm picking on Newport. But I just, I've just known that there's great mansions there that many ostentatious, wealthy people built. And in my family, they've questioned, did he really have that much money? And I think that's a great question, because what that tells me is that nobody really knew he lived that lifestyle. It, it was as if he had the money, but he didn't show it off. And look what he did with it. He bought up all this land that we now enjoy today. And, um, but secondly, he lost a lot in 1929. Don't forget that, when the stock market crashed. <laughs> well, any, any other questions? Now, I have books here. Oh, yes, sir. The question is, did Senator McLean have a special heart for justice and empowering underrepresented people in the political process? And I think that is a common theme that I see in his life. Um, political reform, I think, meant more to him than maybe some other reforms that he could have. There were so many reforms that were needed during this time. You had to pick your spots. But certainly political reform um, was significant to him. And I think he had a view that he trusted the people and that that was part of the support that he got back from them. He was a very popular governor with the people, but not with the machines. And he was a very popular governor, a senator, because I think he had this implicit trust in people. He reached out to groups that were not traditional Republican voting bloc groups. For example, did you know that the St. Mary's Catholic Church here in, Saint, in Simsbury was built by funds given by Senator McLean? And I think that's significant in the sense that he reached out to many groups that were marginalized by other people of his station. So Catholics, uh, he wanted to get a good share of the labor vote. Um, I think he felt that these reforms were empowering people that <clears throat> he eventually wanted to get votes from, which is not a sin, but I think it might have been a calculating position, but I think something in, deep in his heart felt that these were 
the right positions. There's a phrase that says, good policy makes good politics. Doing the right thing can benefit you politically sometimes, and I think that's partly motivated him to take some of these stands. But one other observation on the reform of the way senators were elected, I think that was very personal to him because he ran in 1905 and was rejected by the legislature. And I think he saw a lot of corruption in the way these state legislatures were electing U.S. senators. And when he had a chance to make that reform, he voted affirmatively for the direct election of U.S. senators. So I think he didn't like political corruption and he wanted to do what he could do um, to empower uh, people. Yes, sir. Did he support the 18th and 19th Amendment? He voted on three, <clears throat> 17th, 18th, and 19th, and there's no pattern. 18th prohibition he was against, called it a 17th century throwback. You can't legislate morality, essentially. But on the 19th Amendment, despite the fact that he advocated women's suffrage as governor at the municipal and local level, he was a consistent no voter on women's suffrage at the national level. <clears throat> now, I think that stand created a loss of memory about him in my family. Um, two things, his stance on the League of Nations and women's suffrage put him in the doghouse with my dad and many other, my cousins and uncles, and they thought, this guy, let's write him off. He's just a rich Republican. But I try to unpack in my book the mindset that he and others had that drove him to that position. First of all, he's born in 1857. Many people of that generation, like Woodrow Wilson, uh, opposed women's suffrage up until the very end. But I want you to imagine living through so much change. You know, we've all dealt with change. I mean, I grew up without computers and so on. And, but he grew up without electricity in a rural setting, and cities were coming, and industrialization was happening, and the world was changing so rapidly that I think many people hung on to some traditional values to feel anchored in the past, and that was one for him. But note this, Juliet Goodrich, she was against women's suffrage. So many women, she was part of a group called the National Association Against Women's Suffrage. And so I think these dynamics help explain why he took the position. I do not defend it, but I think it helps explain why it took so long for women's suffrage to pass. One other comment, if I will, about women's suffrage. A Connecticut suffragist was uh, jailed for uh, burning, making a, what was called a liberty fire in front of the White House, burning a speech of Woodrow Wilson. Connecticut suffragist, she's in my book. She was arrested and jailed in Washington, D.C. George McLean visited her in jail and offered to pay her bail. And she refused and said, instead, I'd like you to stay here tonight to see how bad it is here. He didn't do that. But I think that showed a heart uh, for opposition and how he treated people who disagreed with him because many people who opposed women's suffrage were very vocal and even vulgar about their opposition. And he never rose to that or sunk to that level. But again, it's not defending him. Um, a good writer or biographer I've read seeks to understand their subject, not to condemn them or to excessively praise them. It's to understand the mindset of why would someone who is intelligent, who wanted to save birds, why could such a person be against the right of women to vote? And I hope I unpack a little of that. Again, not defending it, but just seeking to understand um, the, what drove people to that position that seems so out of tune with what we believe today. Well, if anyone would like a book, um, I, uh, I had some slides here I was going to share, but um, dispense with them tonight. Um, the book is priced by my publisher, RIT Press, at $34.95, and I've been selling it for $30 on my tour, but the Simsbury price is $25. <laughs> and I had a nice slide that just slashed these numbers down. <laughs> so I'm very happy to 
provide you with a copy of this book. I was pleased to find out that uh, R.J. Julia is carrying it. Um, this week I've gone to a lot of independent bookstores, and so you can probably pick up a copy through them, and three other independent bookstores are carrying it in Connecticut now as well. Not Barnes & Noble, not yet, I hope. They, they're a maybe, but the other independents I met with are carrying it. So feel free to come up and uh, I'll sign the book for you if you'd like. It's $25. I can take cash, a check, or even Venmo. Uh, if you, Venmo is a, I don't quite understand it either. It's my, my wife's Venmo account but it's a way to transfer money uh, electronically. And, and I might have that, it was on my, yeah, I can get it for you if, in case you want to do Venmo. But otherwise, thank you, and it was a great pleasure to be here. And uh, you have so much to be proud of in terms of George McLean, the legacy. It's a reminder of that cliche, we stand on the shoulders of giants. You know, these people that came before us that did things that put us in a strong position today, not to say we don't have challenges in protecting birds and other issues, but it's people like that that um, did so much good that um, it's good to remember their contribution. And uh, in this area, I think you have a lot to be proud of for the McLean family. So thank you very much. Funding for Simsbury Community Television is provided in part by contributions from viewers like you. Thank you.